Hello, this is Jeffrey Kirk. Several years ago, I hosted a series of interviews called the Web Genius Summit. This is one of those interviews. Please note that any links provided in this recording are likely no longer useful as intended. Products mentioned may or may not be available, but lessons discussed in this video still apply. With that, I hope you enjoy this abridged episode of the Web Genius Summit. Today we've got another exciting call planned. And I've got a quote to lead into our call today, and this is from Dr. C.E. Welch. He's of the Welch's grape juice fame, and the quote comes from the late 1800s. He said, many men fail because they quit too soon. They lose faith when the signs are against them. They do not have the courage to hold on, to keep fighting in spite of that which seems insurmountable. If more of us would strike out and attempt the impossible, we very soon would find the truth of that old saying that nothing is impossible. Abolish fear, and you can accomplish anything you wish. And this was from a dentist who created a grape juice empire. But isn't that true? It's generally one fear or another that seems to hold us back. Sometimes we have great reasons to stop, but maybe these reasons are just a convenient way to mask fear. So I'm hoping we can conquer some fears today. I've got Brad Sugars on the line. Brad is an Australian entrepreneur and author who began expressing his entrepreneurial nature at a very young age. He displayed a natural curiosity for how to work smarter and get measurable results. While still at the university, he ran several small businesses. In the process, Brad learned how to start businesses and also how to buy and sell businesses. In time, business owners began approaching Brad to consult about their business. Despite the demand for his services, Brad realized that consulting was not the answer. He wanted business owners to implement the strategies he taught but time restraints meant that he could not service the demand. Brad realized that the missing component between knowledge and implementation was coaching, and thus Action Coach was born. Brad Sugars started his business coaching company in Brisbane, Australia, hiring and training business coaches to leverage his time and to help as many businesses as possible. After several years, still buried by demand and wanting to help even more businesses, he decided to franchise his concept. Now today, Action Coach operates in 26 countries and has more than 1,000 offices around the world. The franchise has received numerous awards, including Fastest Growing Franchise, Franchisee Satisfaction, Best Overall Company, and has been named the number one business coaching franchise for more than five years running. Action Coach is currently ranked by Entrepreneur Magazine as the 65th of the top 500 franchises for 2010. Brad, did that all summarize okay? It sounded a lot easier when you read it. <laughs> Anything you want to add to that? Oh, look, you know, I think that that's a pretty good summary, you know, other than the fact that I'm a dad, I'm an average golfer, I'm a good fisherman, but, uh, you know, you gotta, you got to round out the whole thing. I'm an avid sports freak. I, I don't play many anymore, but I, I definitely go to as many of them as <laughs> I can. Cool. Some good additions there. All right, I've got some questions for you today, Brad, and I'd like to just dig right in. That quote I threw out earlier about abolishing fear and attempting the impossible, well, over the past couple of years, we've certainly seen a lot of panic in the marketplace. But you've been quoted as saying about economic instability, you've said, if you have the knowledge, skills, and guidance, you can turn the situation into a fantastic opportunity for your business. Now, I can certainly assume that some of the guidance you refer to is coaching. Of course, correct me if I'm wrong in that. But I'm hoping you take a few minutes to discuss the other parts, the knowledge and the skills that business owners and entrepreneurs really need to open up what you call a fantastic opportunity. Yeah, look, one of the biggest things that comes with down economies is, is as you said, panic and fear. And those who keep their head about them in that type of a market environment are the ones that are going to do the best possible. Those who go into panic mode and fear mode generally shut down and try and quiet the business. But here's the thing. When business is going well, people aren't on the lookout for new businesses to trade with. You know, in today's market, when people are trying to cut costs or save money or get better value is the terminology I prefer to use, when people are looking for better value, it's pretty simple for us to understand that, hang on, these people are starting to look for a new supplier. They're looking for a new business to do business with. So it's a very important time to have your head on your shoulders correctly. Now, when it comes to the knowledge factor, you know, 80% of business is sales and marketing, 20% is the delivery end of the business. You know, it's, 
it's kind of interesting that the number of business people that spend most of their day doing the operational aspects of the business or the managerial aspects of the business and very little time in sales, marketing and, and building the business. And I always look at it, most businesses started because the owner was good at doing or selling whatever it is they do or sell. And then all of a sudden something happened and the owner went into management. You know, the business got too big. <laughs> I need to manage the business now. Look, imagine Roger Federer Incorporated and we said, you know, Roger Federer has all of a sudden said, look, this tennis business is getting a bit big. I better start managing the business and employ someone to play tennis for me. You know, and I'll, I'll see if I can get them at a good wage as well. <laughs> Great. You know, it, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. But when it comes to a down economy, there's different marketing strategies. There's different sales strategies. There's different employment and recruitment. There's different strategies for each segment of the cycle. The problem, Jeffrey, is that more than 30% of businesses were started in that up cycle. So mm -hmm. most, you know, you've got most people that have never really done a downward cycle and survived through a downward cycle. The upward cycle is, for, as, as we say on the farm, make hay when the sun shines. It, it's not spend all the hay, eat all the hay. It's make it, put it in the shed because we know winter's coming and we've got to get through it. And this is the whole thing. Because cycles last seven to ten years, most people forget the downward cycle and just focus on the upward cycle when it comes. So you know, you've got to have your head on your shoulders. You've got to know how to deal in that market and how to deal during that time. I think we've got to be certain with people that, you know, there, there's more to succeeding in these downward times than just pure luck. Remember this also, 30% of your competitors are going to go out of business in a downward cycle. That's 30% of customers that are going to be looking for somewhere else to do business. Now, you might lose 10 or 20% of your customers, but there's still 10% more out there. It also means that your, best com your competitors' best salespeople are going to be up for a job. Well, why not hire them in that down cycle? I had one of my clients who was in the HVAC business, and he went out and bought basically every small one-man, guy-in-a-van type business for no money down. Basically, he gave them a job hmm. and said, you come and work for me. I'll buy the van off you at cost, and you'll work for me and have a job, but you've got to bring all your customers over. You know, and you look at it, he had a four-fold increase in his business by buying all these guys that were in panic mode. <laughs> wow. So we, we could go on and on on that subject for days. But <laughs> yeah, I'm the, sure. simple, the simple reality is that the biggest challenge for most business owners is they're too busy working to learn how to run their business. Yeah, good point. Great answer. I think, I think there's some nuggets in there for all of us right away. Uh, there's another, another quote of yours that I've heard where you've said, you need to have a vision and you need to think big, then you get into action. And with that, I, I think there's three phrases in there having a vision, thinking big, getting into action. And I'd actually, I'd like to take each one of these separately because I'm sure there's a point of learning in each. So the first part, when you say you need to have a vision, what are you really getting at? Look, vision is a, a very important part of success, and that is you've got to have a picture in your mind of where you're going to. You've, you've got to be able to grasp exactly what it is you're aiming to create. You know, and a lot of business people go into business just to provide themselves a wage. Unfortunately, with that type of short-term thinking, business has short-term results. The business will be out of business in a fairly short frame of, of time. The aim of a business is to go big, to build something that's, that's quite substantial. If you look back at Microsoft and you say, you know, here's a company that's initial vision was to have a computer on every desk running a Microsoft operating system. Now, eventually they dropped their running the Microsoft Office system because there were too many antitrust suits and stuff. <laughs> but, you know, when you sit back and think about it, how, how did a couple of young guys come up with that level of vision? You know, and this is where a lot of business owners see. I don't see why you would go into business if your goal wasn't to create the best business in your industry, at least in your location, for goodness sake. If you were going to start a florist business, wouldn't you want it to be the best florist in town? Now, by being the best, would that also mean you make the best profits? Absolutely. You know, and this is the whole thing. Why would the best florists in town want to work for you if you just wanted to have an average florist business that paid the wages and paid your bills? Yeah, right. You know, you can't have the best floral arrangement. Why would the best flower growers want to sell to you if you took their gorgeous flowers and turned them into average arrangements? 
You know, if you're going to start a coffee shop, wouldn't you want to have the best coffee in town? Absolutely. You know, and this is a part that having a vision of what is it you're aiming to create. You know, I, I, it bugs me that people go into business and don't have the aim to create the best business possible. That is truth. <laughs> so uh, when I started Action Coach, I'll give you our vision. I started Action yeah. Coach, I wrote a vision of world abundance through business re-education. My goal is to re-educate business people everywhere in the world and to do that so that we create a level of abundance for people and for business people. Because you know, the whole win-lose philosophy is out of date now. You know, we know we can do business where both parties win. We know we can do that, so let's make sure we all do it. Mm -hmm. Good point. But that's more, that's more exciting than saying, come work with me, I'd like to make more profit. Uh-huh, yeah. Of course, if yeah. I achieve that goal, am I going to make more profit? You Absolutely bet. I am. And more inspiring along the way. Just a tad. <laughs> inspire and enroll, that's what a vision has to do, two things, inspire and enroll. You do those two and you know you've got a good vision. should sure. be 100 years out too. shouldn't be five years out, ten years out. should be 100 years out. And then this vision that you cast should go also into a, a vision statement, something that simplifies down to a sentence or two? You would hope so. You would okay. hope so, but it doesn't have to. Okay. You know, the thing, the thing with a lot of people is that they get hung up on the words. Don't get hung up on the words. Just get the idea right. The words will come eventually. Okay, good. Well, and then you say you need to think big. Mm -hmm. So... You know, how, how big, what's big enough? And, and I guess related to that, is there such thing as too big? Um, look, there is too big too quick, but there's not too big, Okay. if that makes sense. Look, we live in a world right now where we can do business anywhere in the world instantaneously. There's no, you know, when I first started in business, you didn't do business across the world instantaneously. The Internet wasn't around. We didn't have, well, I mean, it had just started. I remember getting my first CompuServe address and... <laughs> You know, sending messages on CompuServe, and I was all excited. You know, writing basic programs. You know, it was, it was a different time. Today, doing business on a global scale is second nature to a lot of people. But it's also not second nature to a lot. You know, living here in the United States, I know, to, I know a lot of people who've never travelled outside their state, let alone the country. Yeah, that's true. You know, true. and you start thinking, hang on, this is just a little bit crazy now. I mean, I grew up in Australia where... More than 80% of people have a passport versus the U.S. where more than 80% don't. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's a very different way of thinking. We get bought up to do business internationally and to trade internationally. And the U.S. is learning it really tough right now that they've been trying to do business only internally for so long. And you get a car company like Toyota, despite their recent rubbish, who they've built their entire brand on an international platform, Porsche, Mercedes. BMW, they've all built international platform businesses. The only U.S. business that built an international platform was Ford. Guess which one of the, which one of the car companies is still surviving and didn't need the government handouts? Mm -hmm. mm, isn't that an interesting thought? It is. You know, in life, you're either proactive or reactive. You know, you're going to learn all of the lessons. It's whether you learn them by making mistakes or whether you learn them by reading the book first. It's up to you which way you go. Now, the whole point of thinking big is about thinking, well, hang on. You know, if, if I'm going to get into business, do I really want a business that I can only make 10 grand a month out of, or do I really want to build a business that I can make 100,000 a month out of? You know, what's, what's the goal of going into business? And that's where you've got to look at scalability. What is the scalability of this business? Is this business going to get there? That's why I also teach that, listen, your first one or two businesses are often apprenticeships to your third, fourth, and fifth. Don't always think that your first business has got to make you the fortune. You know, I bucket up enough businesses at the start that, <laughs> you know, when you make that many mistakes, you've got to get good with one of them eventually. So yeah, You certainly you, learn a lot along the way. Well, that's the whole point. See, you went to school to learn how to be an employee. You became an employee to learn how to be a business owner. You become a business owner to learn how to, run, to own a big to own a middle-sized business, and then you own a middle-sized business to learn how to run a big business and own your own big business. The, the question is, how long do you want each apprenticeship to take? I watch a lot of people who work 20 years in, in a job and think, well, I should be good at business now. Well, hang on, you've only had one job for 20 years. You've now got to go and learn all business stuff because to get into business for yourself, you've got to know every area of business. You've got to know IT, you've got to know sales, you've got to know marketing, recruiting, managing people, you've got to know how to take out the trash, purchasing, accounting, finance, uh, legals, contracts, HR, you name it. You've got to have an, enough knowledge about each area so that you can either do it or employ the right person to do it. I watch a lot of people employ wrongly because they didn't know enough about the subject to even ask the right questions of a potential employee. 
Sure. Marketing's a big one for that, where people go and employ some young kid that's just graduated college with a marketing degree who really has absolutely no idea how to get new customers, you know, and, and they sit down and go, well, we're going to redesign the logo. Hmm. Woohoo! That's yeah. going to bring in new business. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, you've got to think big, but you've also got to have the strategy to get there. Tactics and strategy are a very important part of achieving the goals that you set for yourself. Mm-hmm. And then the last part, you said you need to take action. Tell us about that one. Well, look, I'll give you the antithesis of this. I have a business owner recently tell me, you know, my staff just don't work that hard. And my answer to him was, yeah, but nor do you. You know, the owner of the business has got to be the hardest worker for a period of time. Mm-hmm. You know, the owner of the business has to be the one doing the most, setting the standard. You know, when I first started in business, I'd work 14 to 16 to 18 hour days. I remember two years of doing seminars where I did more than 200 seminars a year, which meant, have you seen that movie Up in the Air? Oh, I have not seen it yet. Yeah, well, he, I, when you watch that, just think that was Brad's life for a few years. Well, actually, that's <laughs> seven years, I think. And this year it's going to be the same, although this year now with my success it'll be in my own jet. It won't be on commercial airliners anymore. <laughs> um, but my point is that you've got to get down and just work. You know, I watched that movie The Secret, and I take offence at it because there's no way in the world that you can just sit on a hill and own your way to success. Mm-hmm. You know, you, it just doesn't happen. Yeah, you've got to <laughs> think right, but you can't tell people that just thinking right will magically turn everything up. You've got to do right as well. I teach a formula B times do equals have. If you be average and do average, you'll have average. Be great, do great, you'll have great. But Mm -hmm. it comes back to that simple point. You've got to take action. Now, not just work hard, but do the right work as well. If you're a business owner and you're doing a job that you could employ someone $10 an hour to do in your place, then you're only going to be making $10 an hour for your work. I get to the end of the week and I can say to a business owner, right, let's look at the hourly rate for all the tasks you did this week. So, and, and let's say they did 30 hours of $10 an hour tasks and 10 hours of $100 an hour tasks, well, then there's their income. Sure, you know, makes sense. Too many business owners do stupid stuff like sit down and try and save a wage of a $10 an hour person by stuffing an envelope themselves or by mm-hmm. lifting boxes themselves. Look, that, that is just insane. Who's out making sales when you're lifting boxes? Who's writing the business plan when you're in there cleaning the office? You know, stop doing that rubbish and get on to running the business. Stop trying to save a wage. It's costing you your fortune. Yeah, that that is so true. We see that all the time. Mm. Are there some other, you know, really great actions that people should be taking, that business owners should be taking? Oh, look, how many hours do we have? Um, (laughs) We're limiting it to one. Yeah, look, I mean, the the very basics of every business is that it's the percentage of focus on different tasks that I look at. If I look at a business owner who's spending most of their time doing work that is a singular payment structure work, in other words, if I'm in plumbing and I do the plumbing work, then I work once, I only get paid back once. Mm-hmm. If, however, in plumbing, I'm actually going out getting new customers, then I do the work once and that customer becomes a repeat customer, so I get paid back again and again and again and again. Writing a business system, uh, you know, I, I write it once, I get paid back for it many times because many of the staff will be able to use it. Mm-hmm. Um, other examples of that, hiring a staff member and training them. These sorts of things that where you do the work one time and you get repeat benefit from it, whether it's repeat payments, repeat usage. If I design a marketing campaign and develop it and test it and measure it and get results from it, then what I've done is I've achieved something where I've done work one time that gets paid back many times over. Good advice. Thinking back on that quote, having a vision and and thinking big and getting into action, Is the action piece the most important, or does it fall down if you're not pretty much equal on all three? Well, I teach it as a formula today. I teach it dream times goal times plan times action. So it's dream Dream multiplied by goal, multiplied by plan, multiplied by action. Now, it's formulaic, Mm -hmm. you know, so it doesn't matter which one you fall down in. If one of them's a zero, it's all zero. It's it's kaput. Mm -hmm. You know, if one of them's only a one it has no multiplier effect on the others. Sure. So, you know, what what has to happen for us in business is we have to sit down and say, you know what, how do I improve? And, and let's say you went through and scored yourself on dreams. 
you know, because people just don't even have a bucket list today. You sit down and say, what's your bucket list? What's the 101 things you want to achieve before you die on this planet? And most people can't even tell you that. Uh, very simply put, people spend more time planning a vacation than they do a life. Mm -hmm. You know, people spend more time planning a wedding than they do their business. It's, it's insane. But you've got to sit down and say, you know what, if I look at my life, these are the 101 things I want to achieve. I want to be this, I want to do this, I want to go and see that. You know, I have so many sporting events on my bucket list. I have a sporting bucket list, basically. <laughs> you know, and this weekend I'm off to go and, uh, off to Dallas to go and see the hockey on Friday night and then watching Pacquiao Clody on, on sa Saturday night. Why? Because at some stage I wrote these goals down of going to these sorts of events, you know, and you've got to start there. But if you give yourself a score out of 10 and said, you know what, out of 10, my goals are about a 2 out of 10 because I haven't got any written down, I've got a few in my head, but that's about it. So you can't really give yourself more than one or two out of ten. Mm -hmm. But if you've got, you know, your 101 goals written down, you've got pictures of them all, you've got it documented, you know which ones you want to do, how you're going to get there, then you can give yourself a ten out of ten. Same happens then for the goals. You know, what's your goals in life, in business? Do you have five-year goals, three-year goals, one-year goals, 90-day plans, 90-day goals? What level of goal setting have you put forward? And, and to most people, the answer is really, really simple. Well, I've got a few in my head. So you can't give yourself more than one or two out of ten again. You know, and it's got to be in all areas of your life. It can't just be in one area. It's, it's not worthwhile to just say, you know, I've got a goal in, in my business, but I don't have any health goals or I don't have any relationship goals with my family. You know, you, you've got to be an all-rounder in life. There's no use being a, a high performer in one area and messing up the rest because... Being rich and having no friends isn't fun, and being having lots of friends but not having enough money to actually enjoy yourself isn't fun either. You know, mm -hmm. people always say to me, "Oh, but money doesn't buy happiness." Yeah, but it buys a big freaking boat named happiness that you can. <laughs> you see, what it buys is the time to do the things that make you happy. I mean, that's yeah. that's the basic facts of it. The third area is obviously the planning. Uh, you talk about is action the most important part? I personally believe the planning is the most important part. Okay. I, I watch people. And, and you read all these books on execution, and I'm sure you've seen them all as well and read parts of them or all of them. And I sit down and I read them, and I get so offended by them because I sit there and I think, you guys are idiots. You, you, what you've missed in the plan is the training segment of the plan. Every business plan has to have a, well, okay, I've got these 10 staff. I want to achieve these goals. You look at those 10 staff and you go, well, none of them could actually achieve any of those goals. Okay, so... What we actually need to do is have a training segment or a rehiring segment of our plan so that we can actually get the type of people that could pull off this plan. Mm. You know? And so I, I think the planning is a major important factor behind the success of the execution. Is action of vital importance? Yeah, it is. But it's no more important than having a dream and having a goal and having a plan and taking action. Okay. Earlier on, uh, I think we were on the subject of thinking big. You mentioned tactics and strategy. That all fits into the plan section. Is that right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Defining what is the strategy of the business, what are the products, how are you going to price them, how are you going to sell them, what are you going to do with them. You know? and, and that, by the way, is not an easy part. Too many people in business come up with a product or service strategy at the beginning and think this will be how it is at the end. You know, most of the time, the product or service strategy you had at the beginning has to change in order for you to make money because the marketplace reacts in a different way to the way you thought they would. They don't really want to buy it the way you wanted to sell it. Mm -hmm. you know? Fall in love with the customer, not the product. Sure, makes sense. Yeah, we see that actually in the, uh, in the website development arena as well. A lot of businesses will, you know, they'll finally get that website they want and then think that the moment it's published, it's perfect and it'll never need to change again <laughs> and yet you know we're in such a dynamic industry that <laughs> things are changing all the time your website had better change every freaking week or else you're dead <laughs> yeah, um, practically yeah you know, but it has to when you watch and, and my guys i forget the name of the program but they run this program that shows you the heat of each button on the page and and you know we watch it and if the button doesn't have any heat to it then you got to get rid of that button and put a button that people will want to click on mm-hmm you know, it's, it's so vital to just watch that. See, the web is brilliant. Remember in marketing, I remember in marketing when we used to do test and measure of direct mail campaigns, and you'd test a campaign and, and you'd be, it'd be about a month later you'd come back and go, wow, we've finally got the results of that campaign, now we can run it again. On the internet, I, I, could, I could run a campaign today and come back in the morning and go, right, gang, what happened? Great, let's make changes. 
You know, it's so brilliant with the internet that you can make immediate change to, to get better results. Immediate. It's, it's brilliant. I love it. Mm -hmm. and, and easy to test one version against another simultaneously. Oh, so simple. I mean, it, it, it's never been easier for a marketer to be a genius than it is today. Mm -hmm. But it's also never been easier to be arrogant about your marketing and pretend that you've got it right. <laughs> yeah, that's true. All right, Brad, you've got a tour coming up. It's called Business is Booming. And I'm curious why you gave it that name. Um, I think first and foremost to get people's attention. A lot of the time, you know, the name has to be a great name. It's like when Sony na named something the MP3 player and Mac came out or Apple came out and called it the, the iPod. A little bit sexier name, iPod, <laughs> yeah. rather than MP3 player. Look, Business is Booming is, is a tour I've been doing now for a couple of years around the world and, you know, I finally taken the time out actually I'm taking basically an entire year off running companies to just go and give free seminars you know people people say well why would you do it for free and it's, it's really simple I don't need your 20 bucks for a, a, a seminar ticket I would rather get you in and get you taught um, mm -hmm. if we can get the economy back on its feet then everybody wins you know but I, I think the most part is because for me business is actually booming I'm, I'm doing well in this economy, doing very well in some of the businesses and extraordinarily well in other businesses. So I, I just want to sit down and teach people this is how come I've, it's booming for me. Maybe you want to learn how, come it can be, how it can be booming for you. Absolutely. Well, on each stop of the tour, you're going to be spending about three hours or so with the attendees. And uh, you're advertising that you're going to reveal 28 proven strategies that grow businesses. Mm. And I'm hoping, since we do have a little time right now, that you might be able to share a couple of those with our listeners. Some, and I hope as many as possible, can actually make it uh, to one of your local locations. But the reality is, you know, some some of the listeners won't be able to. But even if they can, you know, a, only a if you're in Alaska now are going to be I, great. Yeah. Only if you're in Alaska do you have a reason to not come. Yeah. Um, the rest of you, I'm coming to enough cities that, that you better make it there. If I can fly that long, you can come for a half hour's drive. There you um, go. You know, let's deal with probably the most fundamental error that most business owners make. Let's start right there. Most business owners think of their business as buying a product at some price and selling it at a more expensive price, or buying a service, paying wages at X per hour, and getting Y per hour to make a profit out of employing those people. That way of thinking of business is entirely incorrect. Your business is not that. Your business is the business of buying customers for a certain price, and then selling them enough product or service to make sure that that customer is profitable. See, looking at an overall business being profitable is one way. The main goal, though, is to get every single customer profitable. Now, let me give you some numbers so that people can sort of grasp onto this. Imagine you'd run a $1,000 advertisement and you got 10 new customers from it. You've just paid $100 a customer. That's your buying cost, or what we call your acquisition cost per customer. Now, if I was to sit down, Jeffrey, with 100 business owners, have a guess how many of them could tell me what their acquisition cost of a customer would be? Oh, 10% maybe? Oh, you are the most generous man I've met today. <laughs> um, let me tell you something. <laughs> <laughs> Look, if 10% could tell you the, the acquisition cost of their customer, in fact, if 10% of them could tell you their conversion rate, we would be lucky, of, of percentage of customers yeah, that you're right, you're versus right. those that came in. The number of business owners that can tell you their cost of acquisition of a customer, I can boil it down to one number. How many clients do I have? My coaching clients are 99.9% .9 sure the only ones that can ever tell me that number. You know, others will have a guess at it. Oh, I think it's this. You know, once you get really good at this, Jeffrey, you don't want to just know it for the overall business. You want to know it per marketing campaign. You want to know it per this, per that. The Internet's great because we can do it there so strong and so easily. Um, and, and it becomes far better. Now, if I work out I'm buying a customer, um, I'll give you an example, actually. This is a traditional business, a little bakery. So this guy ran his bakery. He spent 300 bucks a week on advertising, and uh, first of all, I said to him, how many new customers do you get from your ads? Guess what his answer was? No, he didn't know. Yeah. Like most business owners, he had no idea whether his advertising was bringing him a result or not. You know, the only way he worked out of advertising was working as if someone actually mentioned it to him, which, you know, just not good enough. So, you know, I started teaching him to, to find out. So over two weeks, he found out that he was getting about 10 customers a week from his advertising. Now, 
Here's the challenge with that. $300 ad, 10 customers, $30 a head is what he's paying per new customer. Guess how much he sold to the average customer when they walked in the door? Uh, what's he selling? A bakery. It's a little a bakery. bakery. Probably just a few bucks worth of stuff. Yeah, 4 bucks 50 So he's losing $25.50 every time he gets a new customer in the door. In fact, more than that because he had cost of product sold. So when you think about marketing as how much am I paying to buy customers, then you start thinking about it entirely differently. So I sat down with him and said, listen, here's what we want to actually do. We want to buy customers a lot cheaper. So what we're going to do, and I asked him this question, what's it take, take for you to make a chocolate eclair? Because I'd tried his chocolate eclairs and they were really good. And he said, well, you know, that costs about hard cost 30 cents a piece. And I said, well, fantastic. Here's what we're going to do. And I wrote him a new ad that said, free chocolate eclair. Just cut out and bring in this coupon. Da, 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 da. There's the ad. And uh, he looks at me and he said, Brad, I couldn't possibly run an ad like that. And I said, why not? And he said, do you realize how many hundreds of people in this town would come in to get a free chocolate eclair? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I do, actually. That's why we're running the ad. And I showed him the math. And I said, look, if we only get 300 people, then instead of spending thirty dollars to buy a customer, you're spending a dollar for advertising to buy them, and you're spending thirty cents per eclair. So you're spending a dollar thirty to buy someone that's going to spend four fifty on average. Now we taught the salespeople how to do better sales, and we got his sales average up to five fifty. Sixteen out of seventeen people that came in to grab the eclair bought something else. One in every seventeen got the eclair and did a runner. They're mm. probably all related to each other in the end. <laughs> But you look at it and you think, well, hang on, this is – in the first week he ran it, by the way, 584 people came in and, and, and got a new eclair, got, wow. a, got a free eclair. Now, that's 584 people that had most probably never been to his store, never knew where his store was. Now, all of a sudden, they know where his store is. They've tried it. He's given them one of their buy 10, get the 11th one free cards. You know, in, in many of the cases, he got their name and address because we taught the salespeople how to get that to get them onto their, onto their database. You know, and here we are with an entirely different business. But then again, he's still, the next week I rang him and I said, hey, how did you go with that ad this week? He said, oh, Brad, we didn't run it. We were far too busy last week. Hmm. You know, and you sit there and you think, my God. And I know people will laugh at this guy for doing that, but how many businesses do we have out there that used to do stuff before you got busy that made you money and you stopped doing it because you got too busy all of a sudden? Sure. You know, everyone does that stuff. It used to, well, I used to. Well, what if instead of you used to do it, what if someone in the company could do it, not you, and you still make money out of it? That's, that's called acquisition cost. Now, if I sit and look at it and I say, you've got to learn what your numbers are for acquisition cost. I used to have a dog food business. I was, uh, my profit on the first sale, now this will blow people away. My profit on the first sale was $38. Now, that's because people would spend $108 on the first sale because we home-delivered the dog food. They bought six weeks at a time. We had a vet nurse do the health check on them while they were there. You know, so it was, it was a great product with a great service, and it worked really, really well. Now, if I wanted to have an unlimited growth strategy for my business, here's the question for you, Jeffrey, and for everybody listening. How much could I spend to buy a new customer that I had an unlimited marketing budget? Your profit was 38 bucks. 38 bucks. So... But Anything, anything, less less than that. Than, anything less than that, I got an unlimited buy. So if I was buying customers, my radio ads bought me customers for $22. How many times could I go out and spend 22 and get 38 you reckon? Uh, yeah, lots. lots. <laughs> <laughs> it's unlimited, isn't it? But here's the thing. If you don't know what your acquisition cost is, you can't do these sorts of strategies. And this is why working with a business coach is of vital importance for most people because they don't know the strategies. They don't know how to implement them yet. So we got to teach them this stuff. Now, if I if I go to that particular example, and this is this is the flip side of acquisition cost. And I I don't I know most people won't have cottoned onto that idea yet. So please chat with one of the coaches and ask them how do you get unlimited customers. If I went and let's say here's a trick question for you, Jeffrey. Let's say I wanted to buy a customer and I had a magazine ad, and I, this did actually happen. I had a magazine ad that bought me customers for fifty dollars a piece. Can I run that ad and keep running it? And your profit is thirty-eight, so you're losing twelve bucks each. Yeah, on the first sale. On the first sale. Well, if you only get one sale, then you can't keep running it. But if you could get multiple sales, you could. See, I knew you'd get that point. That's where you go to the second number. Not only do you need to know the acquisition cost, but you need to know lifetime value. You need to know what is a customer worth to us over their entire lifetime. So when you sit down and look at it, well, you know, how much are you going to spend in your lifetime on, on uh, toilet paper? How much are you going to spend in your lifetime on, on milk? You know, what's a lifetime value of a customer? See, in my dog food business, we knew our average customer stayed with us three years. 
that when your average customer spends $800 a year with us uh, buying dog food. Now, if you know those two numbers, you know that how much is my lifetime value of a customer? 2400 Now, that seems all well and true that, yep, it's definitely 2400 It wasn't. It was a lot more than that. Why? Our average customers uh, sent three referrals to us uh, every year. Sorry, two referrals to us on average a year, so three total people. Now, if our average customer sent us two people, then guess what those two people became? Average customers. Mm -hmm. So they, on, in turn, referred us another two people each year. Now, our average customer stayed with us three years, so they'd refer to us six, who would then refer to us six, and so on and so on and so on. So you've got to learn your lifetime value of a customer. Now, if I was spending 50 bucks and I got 38 profit on the first sale, and then six weeks later I got 38 on the second sale, What's the only limiting factor to my growth of my business? Cash flow. Interesting. So, you know, it's simple stuff like that. that and I know that I wish I had two hours to teach that one strategy to people. Mm -hmm. and that's why I say, look, if, if you're struggling with those strategies, grab one of my coaches, sit down with them, and, and go through it in detail as to how you can learn that stuff and work with it for you and your business. Um, and for all of your customers, uh, Jeffrey, just make sure if they go to actioncoach.com and go to uh, – our page there where it says find a coach. If they just type in that they met me on your program, I'll make sure my coaches give them an hour of, of their time free of charge. Awesome. Got something else? Some something another uh, another strategy that might be really useful for us? Oh, I could spend plenty of time, but then why would they need to come to the seminar? Well, you've got you know dozens of others. Actually, it's, it's <laughs> kind of funny, you know, because. Uh, having written now 14 books, I have three more books that I'm trying to write at the moment and getting them done on, wow. on time for the publishers. And, and all of this data, and it comes down to a very important factor that a lot of people miss, and, and that is that you know, the, the number of ideas and strategies of how to build a business are phenomenal, phenomenal. You know, It's crazy how many ways. My first book, Instant Cash Flow, there's 288 different profit-building strategies broken down into the five main areas of how you build a business. So let's deal with those five main areas right now. It, to grow a business, there's a simple formula that you have to learn, and it, it is the most important formulaic methodology or the most important, important formula for running a business. First of all, it's leads times conversion equals customers. So leads times conversion equals customers then hopefully everyone's writing this down because this, this can get a little tricky if they don't. If they don't, just go to YouTube and type in five ways Brad Sugars and there'll be a video on it on there. Oh, perfect. Leads by conversion equals number of customers. Then number of customers by number of transactions by average sale equals revenues. So leads by conversion equals customers. Customers is then multiplied by number of transactions and average sale to equal the revenues of the business. And then revenues are multiplied by margins to give the, the profit at the end of the business. Now, you'll notice there's three equal signs in there, equals customers, equals revenues, and equals profits. Those three numbers are the three that most business owners focus on most often, and they are the three least important numbers on the page. Mm -hmm. They're the end result of the other five numbers, number of leads, num conversion rate, number of transactions, average sale, and margins. You get those five numbers, First of all, you've got to know them. Second of all, you've got to sit down then and plan how you're going to increase each of those five numbers by 10% a year, each number by 10%. Now, if you, if, using the multiplier effect, if you increase each of those five numbers by 10%, then you get a 61% increase in the bottom line of the business. You get about cool. a 46% increase in the revenues of the business. And that's about as fast as your average business can grow. Mm. Most businesses can't grow much faster than that because you, you, out, you, know, you outgrow your resources, either your human resources or your cash flow resources or your capital resources. You know, you've, you've got to be able to grow the resources as fast as you grow the sales. So you know, when you sit down with it and look at it, and you know, my, uh, again, my first ever book, Instant Cash Flow, um, that book there has uh, around about between 50 and 80 strategies in each of those uh, in each of those five areas. So, you know, lead generation. There's over 70 strategies there. You know, and you sit and you look at it and you think, well, hang on, maybe I should learn a few of these because most business owners would be lucky to be using three or four business strategies for lead generation. Cool. I'm going to have that uh, instant cash flow link up to your book on the website as well, Perfect. so people that want that can get access to it. Yeah, Amazon.com's got them all. Yeah, you betcha. Good. Um, you able to take a question or two off the from the listeners? As long as we got them, I'll take them. All right. 
If you're on the phone and you want to ask a question, just hit star 2 on your handset. That will effectively raise your hand and let me know that you'd like to speak, and then I can put you on. If you're listening in on the webcast, there's a box off to the left that you can type in, and I'll see that pop up here. I uh, can't guarantee that I'll be able to take everything, but we'll take a look. One of them here that's already come up looks like, what are the top three things I need to do for my business to capture market share as the economy picks up? Um, first and foremost, you better start marketing now. The economy is already picking up. You know, one of the things that when you look at the cyclical effect of the market, the, the stock market always goes first, business market comes second, real estate market comes third. So what we need to do is start marketing today and be ready for marketing today. The second thing you need to do is start having your salespeople trained uh, right now. You know, make sure your salespeople are ready to handle the inquiry. Measure their conversion rate. You will find it's quite incredible the difference in conversion rate from one salesperson to another. And, and the variance is, is a major impacting factor on, on the profitability of companies. Hmm. Conversion rate is by far and away the fastest and easiest way to in, impact the bottom line of a company. If I walk into any company, I'll find, you know, if they've got 10 salespeople, they've got 10 different sales strategies, 10 different sales tactics. And you'll look at them, and one of the guys or one of the gals is beating everybody else by, you know, hand down. And you've got to look at what are they doing that no one else is doing. How come they're getting results when no one else is getting those results? Good. I've got a, uh, a caller here. All right, you're on from 262-786. Hello. Hey, Hello. how are you doing? Good, good. Great. I've uh, been uh, with one of your coaches for a while. My, my question is, is we're, we've been paying our people by the hour. Mm -hmm. And we're doing our best to get, you know, we're an, we're an electrical contract and we're paying our people by the hour and we're non-union so we can shift that. Right. Now's a good time to do that. We're going to be paying by performance. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you have anything to, to add to that idea or thoughts on that? Yeah, look, I think there's, there's three different schools of thoughts on performance. One is that if, as long as people have got a, enough base salary um, or enough base income, then performance can be motivating. If it's purely performance, then the fear factor can actually drive down productivity uh, and remove it from that. The second, the, the second thing that I'd want to look at is what is the personality base of the people you've got? Are they a competitive natured style person? I would imagine that if you're in the electrical contracting arena, few of your people would actually be what I would call a high driver, high need to win style. Now, you might have a lot of them. I'm not sure on the personality style of your people. But if your people are more, if, if you use the DISC profiling, the more S, the stability style person, then going to a performance-based pay structure will have almost no impact on them because they'll just do the same level of work anyway. Um, the best form for those, that group of people of performance criteria is actually peer pressure, where it's a team-based performance benefit and the team wins or the team loses. That is generally going to be the best way for that group of people. Now, have you done any surveying of your team to see how they feel about it, what they think, how they, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, that's a great idea. No, no, I haven't uh, actually asked them. I, I, I've been uh, dribbling out the idea and just seeing reactions. Mm -hmm. but, okay. Uh, it never hurts to grab two of your senior people and say, listen, guys, we're going to move to a more performance base. We'd like to reward you guys more for doing better work. Um, we would like two of you to be on the group that actually comes up with this strategy because um, if there's a great book on change by John Cotter. It's called Our Iceberg is Melting. One of the things he puts in there about change is that the biggest thing you need to do is have a few champions on the team for that change. So if you get two of your senior people involved in designing it, guess what they're going to do for the rest of the team? They're going to drive it, drive it through the company. They're going to sell it to them. Mm -hmm. You know? They're going to tell them, this is how we all make more money, guys. This is how we're all going to do better for it. And as long as it is a win-win, it'll do well. Great. Thank you. Excellent. Great question. Thanks. Yep. Thanks. Awesome. Let's see. We've got one other hand raised. I'll pop that one on. Okay, you're on the air. I don't have a phone number. It comes up as anonymous. Uh, hi. My, my name is Cheryl. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Cheryl. We got you. Hi. Okay. Well, I'm an independent contractor, and so I don't have a sales force, sales team, all of that. I am, I have a two-part career. I'm a professional organizer, so I handle, uh, you know, uh, mild clutter to pack rats and hoarders, and then I am just finishing up school, 
after about four years, I've been studying to become a holistic uh, nutritionist, and I integrate the two. So my message is how disorganization in the home so dramatically affects health, fitness, and nutrition. Uh, Most of my clients, when one area is deficient, the other is as well. So I'm embarking on a new kind of a, you know, I'm adding the nutrition to my organizing business. And I know you you say... So what can I help you with today? Yeah, so I'm just asking, I I want to your opinion uh, about coming up with one statement on, uh, you know, being at network mi- and network events and mixers on what I actually do. And I came up with, I get people nutritionally organized. And I'm just wondering, as you said, don't get caught up on, caught up on the words, but uh, does that resonate with you? Does it make sense to you? Uh, if I said that to you at a mixer or networking event, would you understand uh, does that make sense, or is it okay. really? Let me confusing? ask you this question: Are you telling me are you, when you meet me, you, do you want me to understand what you do, or do you want me to understand the benefits of what you do? Absolutely, what I do, but the, of course the benefits as well. So, if you were to smack me in the face with what you do, I'd be like, oh, okay. If, however, you do find out for me the benefits of what you do, then maybe I might get excited. Okay. So, if you look, if you sit down and look at the benefits of of what you do. You know the benefits. What do you? I, what What is it that you do? I help people increase their productivity through nutrition. Okay. You know what right. is it that you do? You know, find something that is of benefit. Now, by the way, when you go to mixers and networking events, test and measure different things. You know, do do different stuff. I know as a business coach, I always I walk into a room whenever I'm at one of those networking things, and they give you a one minute introduction. I always stand up and say, Hey, I like everyone in the room to just raise your hand as high as you can. Now, everyone raise your hand another two inches higher, and they all do. And I go, see, that's the difference between not having a business coach and having a business coach, those extra two inches. <laughs> right, right. You know, so you've got to come up with something that actually illustrates it to me, that excites me, that gets me wanting to participate with you, not something that bores me. Yeah, I know, and I understand so, that. That's why I'm, so I'm your going So organization, oh, man, that's, I'm, I'm already in pain when you mention organization. <laughs> And then you mention nutrition on top of organization. Man, I'm in double pain at this point in time. It sounds like you're going to make me eat at certain times, and I've got to eat roughage all the time. You know, so you got to remember benefits, not not what. Facts facts are important, but benefits are far more important. Got it. Great, great question. Okay. All right, thank, thank you. you. All right, Brad. We had an opportunity to look at some of the strategies that uh, you'll be covering when you're on your tour. And if you w- would like, just take a few minutes and uh, explain, you know, what what's going to happen if someone shows up at your business's booming tour. Why should our listeners really make it a priority to be there? Well, uh, I'm brought up Australian. We're brought up blunt. So pretend I'm a cross between a Texan and a New Yorker, okay? <laughs> so come from a really big place, and, and we have a bit of an attitude. Um, look, it's it's pretty simple. How often do you get to learn from a guy who's actually done it? I, I'm not coming to teach you to go and say, you know, you sign up for my next seminar or this or that. I'm coming to teach you because I want to teach. Um, it's what I do. So that's the most important part of understanding. You know, the networking side of it, getting with other business owners, that's a very important part of it as well. But the most important simple thing is I, I don't know when the last time you had someone who's achieved what I've done you know, in top 50 entrepreneurs in, in North America, given entrepreneurs ranking. Last year in the top five CEOs in the country at the American Business Awards. But when The next time you get a guy who's achieved what I've done coming through your town, make sure you're there. I would recommend it. And the fact that it's me, of course I'm going to recommend it as well because I know, I know what I deliver. I've, I've done this stuff for many, many years, and I have a lot of fun doing it. So. Cool. Plus we'll have fun. Yeah. Absolutely. That's one thing I can guarantee in my seminars. We have a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Well, I can add to that as well. Um, last time you toured, uh, at least as far as I know, uh, back in 2007, you had the Billionaire in Training tour. Yeah. And you stopped in Milwaukee, and I, I was there, um, and it was it was a ton of good information. And then you also had a three-day session later in the year in Las Vegas called the Entrepreneur's Masterclass, oh. and that was intense. That was three days of real high information density it was you know mind blowing actually building upon everything that that i had learned from my action coach and from your billionaire in training session it, it was just marvelous the reason i'm telling this to to all the listeners is that 
you got to know that it's worthwhile to attend one of Brad's sessions, whether it's three hours or three days. Definitely worthwhile. All right, Brad, can I, can I throw one last quickie in for you? Absolutely. All righty. Uh, we just want to pull all the pieces together, and, and I know we are out of time, and I like to end on time, but we had that little technical glitch at the beginning. Just kind of bring us back to the purpose of the, the Web Genius Summit. Can you throw out one thing that our listeners can do, some action they can take right now? As soon as they hang up the phone, what should they do next to make their business more profitable right away? Well, actually, I'm going to give you four things. Number one, make a list of the 20 things you should be doing, but you're not. Number two, sit down and actually plan tomorrow before you go home today. Number three, make sure that you've updated your Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn profiles before you finish out the day with something business-oriented. And number four, very simple, very easy to do, but also very tough to do. Make sure you grab a book tonight and read something about how you can improve your business tomorrow. Awesome. Thank you for that. Four really good, very good tips. All right. Well, we do have to end it here. We are after 5 o'clock, and I do like to respect people's time. So, Brad, it was great having you on the line with us today. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your schedule to be with us. I certainly wish you the best of luck on your upcoming tour, and I'll see you in Milwaukee on April 20th. See you then, Jeffrey. Take care. All right. You too. Bye-bye. Bye.